Good morning, good morning, everybody. Hello, 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 hello. Nice to have you all here today. Wonderful summer day. We are live streaming. Everybody, just greet everybody on live stream. Hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. Nice to have you all with us today. God's going to do something for you today. Do you agree? Yes. Amen, amen. So what we're going to do, we're going to do something quickly different. We've, I don't think we've ever done this before. I don't know. For a long time. I can't. It depends. Okay. I want you to stand up. Don't handshake, but just look at somebody and say, welcome to the Oasis of Love. <laughs> you can stand up. You can stand up. And just say, welcome to the Oasis of Love. If you want to keep your mask on, you're welcome. Something good is going to happen to you today. Keep your social distancing as far as you can. <laughs> awesome. Bless from a distance, Bluetooth, like Bluetooth, 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 awesome. So, I want to open up with the scripture today, so everybody, I'm going to open up with the scripture in Psalm, uh, Psalm 16, verse 11. Now, this speaks about you and me, okay, you lead me in the path of life, God leads you and me in the path of life. I experience absolute joy in your presence. Say, I experience absolute joy in God's presence. You always give me sheer delight. Beautiful. So we are, we've come together. The presence of God is here. And you can experience Him this morning. I want you to really open up your heart. Um, we've got awesome somebody that's going to preach this morning. And God is going to speak to you today. So right now, I want you to close your eyes. And we're just going to open up in prayer. Thank you, Tammy. Father, thank you for this awesome, awesome morning, Lord. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for just your faithfulness, Father. Even when we are not faithful, you are faithful. Thank you, Father, that angels are ministering spirits to the heirs of salvation. And that you in our midst. And right now, Lord, I pray for every person that's here, even watching on live stream, that they will experience your peace. <laughs> experience your peace. Experience your joy. Lord, I just prophesy hopelessness will go. And people will just receive a new freshness of hope and just know that you are in control Thank you, Father, for your presence right now. Thank you that we don't have to pray for open heaven. We have got an open heaven. We are, we are, we are, we are seated with you in heavenly places right now. And Lord, from that place, we could just experience your unconditional love right now. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Let's just pray in the spirit. Jebla Marto Stele Helia Sobrats Vetele Pondoroya Lefaldias Pelalema Sus of Leleve Sobloto Lubalio Malia Mustundia Sebrius for Vaisha Bacaboy Barco Bonio, my Colobene Volcus Halavole Morphi Halakai Strehalopus to Rocomo Darmasun Salamasuto. I just declare and speak into the atmosphere just right now signs and wonders and miracles. Thank you, Father. Right now, whoever needs a miracle will receive one today. Whoever needs healing will receive healing today on live stream as well. Mosh Kalamang Lobio Lerto Sutombe Kayosh Boto Hopaya by Hoshoro Fel Halabro Sobra Mando by Epaya Masovi and Nango Bar Susundri. Is Brehel Karupra Tarama in Broboyo, Momper El Mal Otunum in Calais, Lel Ohulu Kalakosi Eke, by Oboyo, Eke Boruming, O by a Mosh put to him Borabasar Hede. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You are here right now. You're so good, Lord Jesus. In Salamendo, this mino main no man sumumbro, Moshavalay Alma Susufitili Kerikado Toto. Thank you, my father. 
Awesome. You ready to praise God? We're going to just go for it. We just I want you to get let loose. Just forget about your week. Forget about what's happening in our country. Forget about what's, whatever you are feeling that you're facing through right now. I want you to make a choice. I want you to make a choice to look away from that distraction today and look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. It is a choice. It is a choice to look away. And I want you to mentally just say, today I'm forgetting about whatever you're going through. I'm forgetting about whatever it might happen. I want to just meet with God because He wants to meet with you. And He's here right now to meet with you. So let's go for it.
because you are a child of God. He died on the cross for you, for your sins, so that you can walk in victory and freedom this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. You are free. You are free. No one can stand against you. God is on your side. He loves you so much, so much. He is the great I am. Mountains shake before him. Demons run and flee because he is the great I am. We stand in the power of his presence this morning. Free. Totally. Totally. Thank you, Jesus. There is no one that can match your love, Father. It's because of you that we can stand here, Father, and feel so accepted and feel so loved, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. We are free. Free. Your ways are higher than 
speaking to you, but you can't break through, then do something. Just break yourself out of the position that you're sitting now. Do something. Do a manifestation. If you need to jump up and run, do it. If you need to jump up and clap your hands, do it. Just break through your physical self that is stopping you from receiving what God wants for you. Whether that is in renewing of the mind like Sharif was speaking, or your healing, or your financial breakthrough, do something that shows God, I take this. I take this with my whole being. Do something so you can receive it from God. bless you. Thank you. You may be seated. Thanks, guys. That was good. Amen. Thank you, Father. Put your blessing into me. Well, on that note, she was just hold on a second. You hot, you hot, eh? <laughs> what can you say? It's nice cool weather. I see summer's uh, been forgotten again, and winter's decided to take us uh, take over. I believe next week's going to be cold again. Some days, like down to like 14 degrees or something. So, so I think even the weather's got confused in the coronavirus. So, but bless it, Lord. Thank you. We know what He knows what we need, but we do need rain. That's what we do need. Amen. Just not the cold. He can keep the cold. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Trust you all well. Are you all good? You s- you were very quiet today in praise and worship, but I know you were worshiping and praising God and loving Him. I could see on your faces. I think JD purposely put those bright lights on my face so I couldn't see what you were doing and moan at you, so you can thank JD for that. So, so but having said that, do we have any first-time visitors, somebody visiting us for the very, very first Sunday? Welcome, young man. You're so welcome. Let's give him a, an applause. I hope you enjoy it. Just know God is on your side and he's got you. Amen. So, and then obviously I'd love to welcome all our friends and family. It's always good to see you. Thank you for always coming and loving us. Um, you don't actually have a choice, I suppose. Hey, <laughs> It is what it is, isn't it just? Um, I'm just here to tell you, don't forget to please die rise. Um, we're having a prayer meeting on Saturday, the 17th of October from 8 to 9. So if you can make it, please come along. Um, Pastor John just wants to get everybody together in prayer, and he promised we're just going to be praying from 8 to 9. So do come along uh, October the 17th. Yes, it's actually not too far away. Uh, Once again, Sunday school, we know the drill. If your children are here with you, the Sunday school is open. They are doing lessons. we got youth every Friday night at 7 p.m. Communion, as you know, at the back. Um, And then I was told... They're slowly starting to open up the kitchen, slowly but surely. So next week, they said, I have to advertise because these are very, very popular, and they sell out very quickly. They're selling chicken, roti, rolls. Authentic. Stacy, 
Oh, she's already booked too, Lee and Yogi. <laughs> she's already booked too. <laughs> Put your money where your mouth is, girl. So please come along. Come to the kitchen. They'll be serving food there. Nice to see you, Maureen. I know you've come, but I, I just haven't seen you myself personally. So nice to see you. So do come along next week. If you don't want to cook lunch, come and eat here, all right? And then obviously our usual water and Cokes and things like that will be for sale. And then Pastor John may asked me to mention on the 11th of October in the evening, we're going to have a continue the leadership training, uh, which is the ones who attended those, you know who you are, who did the preaching and teaching course. There's some things Pastor John wants to add to it, so keep a lookout. Um, he's looking at, I think it'll be 5 o'clock uh, next Sunday evening, so keep that time open, but we will be sending you a WhatsApp in the week. Is that right? Okay. And then, do you want, do you want to do that first quick before I start the next? Okay, all right. And then lastly, um, I don't know if you have noticed the lighting. Uh, for those techies, guys who are into that kind of thing probably would have, but if you're a woman like me, you probably didn't notice. But they have been working on the lights. People have graciously donated towards it. So these lights we own. So JD has big plans. He's looking at me doing a massive Christmas production. He's got so much faith in me. Uh, who knows if that's going to happen? However, we just need to get a few more. So Pastor John asked, if you still want to give, please can you... Uh, put it in an envelope, or if you're going to do a transfer into the account, just mention lights. We still need about 10,000 rand. It sounds a lot, but it's worth it because these ones we keep. So, and I don't know if you noticed the difference in the lighting th uh, this morning, I was going to say this evening, um, on the stage and that each, each musician that has their own light now, and they put lights as well for Pastor John, so when he walks up and down like I do, at least the light is on him as well, and it's, it's good for the TV as well, so in live stream. So if you want to do that, it'll be really appreciated. Otherwise, that's about it. I see there's JD's on the phone and he's talking code, so. They're not behaving, Pastor John. Really not behaving, yeah. <laughs> okay, here he is. Hello? Good morning. Good morning, church. How are you doing? Glad to see you all there. Amen. No, you're not. No, I'm not, but, I'm, but I am there in the spirit. I, I drove to a place where I could get signal, and then I started watching. And I see Apostle Ken Hassens is watching from uh, Zim. So welcome, Apostle Ken. Amen. And uh, great worship. Well done. The lighting looks good. So I'm looking forward to the, the message this morning, the word. Amen. Amen. So love you all. Love you. Have a good service. Thank you. Keep up the good work. Love you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You see, he approved, so we can carry on now. Okay, um, I'm going to ask, um, we've asked Andre if he would do the offering this morning. Um, maybe, Tammy, uh, can you come up in the meantime, straight after the offering's been taken, uh, Tammy's going to bless us with an item, and then uh, Pastor Yaku is going to be preaching this morning and bringing us the word, so. I don't know. Thank you, Jaden. Well, it helps if you know where the button is hidden. Um, it's such an honor to, to actually share the Word of God with a well-read audience. Um, you know what, it's, it's actually very difficult for me to prepare something on offering because I start at one point and, uh, you know, when, within one night I've got three messages and I'm thinking, God, so which one is it, God? And, I, you know, you, you've heard all those messages about sowing a seed and you'll reap a hundredfold or, you know, all of those coercive messages. And they might be slightly out of context, but there's still truth in it. But I don't want to go that route. So I thought, God, I want to, to bring a message on offering using scripture that's got nothing to do with offering because your word is rich enough to speak about it. We sang this morning, all glory and honor belong to you. And Solomon even wrote it in Proverbs 3 verse 9. He said, honor the Lord with all your goods, with, with your tithes and your offerings. So 
you know, he, he made that point. He says, this is what we need to do. Um, but I want to tell you a story. So this young man, he was born on a farm. He went to agricultural school. And he passed in flying current, color, colors. He did everything exactly the way that was taught to him. His father was a wheat farmer, so he had the practical background, but he went and he studied the theory. When he finished school, his father gave him a, a field. He said to him, there, this is yours. He gave him the implements. He gave him the tractors. He gave him everything that he needed. He gave him the irrigation system. He even said, you can have some of my servants, some of the laborers. So the young man went out into the field very excited. He prepared the land. He cleaned the land. He plowed the land. He fertilized the land. And then he, and he waited until it was the right season, until the rains came. So he prepared everything exactly correctly. Yet he didn't put any seed in the ground. And he sat and he waited. So his father says to him, you're not going to get a harvest. He said, Dad, that's the Old Testament. The New Testament works differently. We have faith. We can do things by faith. Now tell me, is that young man a farmer? Why not? He's got the land. He's going to church. He's reading the Bible. He's doing everything. What's wrong? The seed. Okay, so he, he, he sows the seed. He waits. The wheat comes up. It stands on the land. He sits on the porch and he watches it. Eventually, the harvest is ready, but he sits and he watches it. And it starts to wither, and he sits and he watches it. Is he a farmer? Is he really a farmer? He's not taking the harvest down. So being a farmer requires you to do a few things. You do not just have to have faith. So I thought, let's look at James. Now, he's, it's a powerful book. So... Um, if you can have a look at James 11, verse 22 to 20, uh, James 1, verse 22 to 27, in the Amplified, I've got an Amplified Bible, believe it or not. Um, I just don't read it. But I thought this morning, let me do it. It says, but be doers of the word, obey the message, and not merely listeners to it, betraying yourselves into deception by reasoning contrary to the truth. For if anyone only listens to the word without obeying it and being a doer of it, he's like a man who looks carefully at his own natural face in a mirror. I think we can say a woman also looking at her face in a mirror, her own natural face. For he thoughtfully observes himself and then goes off and promptly forgets what he was like. Has, do you know anybody that it has happened to that has carefully observed their face in a mirror and then walks away and they forget what they were like? Um, we can I'm, I'm, hold on to the previous verse. I, I just need to add something to that. So, what is he actually saying here? What is James saying here? We can say that the Word of God is that mirror. All the songs that we sang this morning, we, we testified to God how lost we were. We testified how terrible we were, that we could not be anything without Him. And we glorify Him for saving us. And we read the Word, and we believe because the Word says that. The Word says that we are now heirs with Him. He has saved us. He has not only saved us from death, but he has placed us in a place of authority. That's what the word says. So if I read the word, this is what I see in the word. But I carefully read it. I carefully study to see exactly what the word says about me. It's not condemning me. It's not telling me about anything. But what James says there, when you stop reading the word and you walk away from it, he says you promptly forget what you were like. He's talking about what you were like prior to your salvation. You forgot how lost you were. You forgot what a sinner you were. 
because you saw here in the Word of God how awesome and how great I'm right now. And it's great. It's good. But James wants to, us to remember where we come from. Where did we come from? So we can go now to James um, 2 verse 18. Is this all right? So he says, but someone will say, say to you then, you say you have faith and I have good works. Remember the little boy, the farmer, who's not a farmer? Now show me your alleged faith apart from any good works, if you can. And I, by good works of obedience, will show you my faith. You believe that God is one. Okay. I've, I've got a whole message just on this, this. You believe that God is one. Let's look at Mark 12, verse 28 to 29. To set this, the scene, Jesus was teaching. He was teaching in parables, using parables. And there was a learned man, a Pharisee. He was watching him. And while he was watching Jesus, he was listening to the questions and the answers that Jesus gave. And then he says, okay, it's a scribe, correction, not a Pharisee. He's, then one of the scribes came up and listened to them disputing one with another and noticing that Jesus had answered them fitly and admirably, he asked, now, he had noticed, the King James says that Jesus has answered them well. So when he noticed that, and he's got his own question, what is his expectation? How will Jesus answer him? He'll answer him well. So he's going to get a very, very good answer. So he asks him, which commandment is first and most important of all in its nature? Next verse. Jesus answered, the first principle of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Lord our God is one. This is the most important. How could this be the most important? We can go back to James. James 2 verse 18, where he said, uh, You believe that God is one. You do well. He says, so do the demons believe, and they shudder. So believing that God is one is actually a very powerful statement. That statement there, we, you know, if you look at uh, Zechariah 14 verse 9, he says um, basically that God is such um, a powerful God that his name is one. That name being his character, the one being the Hebrew word echat, which actually means unity. So his character is unity. So what we need to see here is that what God is showing, what, <clears throat> what James is saying and what Jesus answered, he said, God is a God of unity. This is the most important thing that we have to understand. God is a God of unity. Yes, if we continue in, in Mark, we would have seen that he said, you have to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind. And that you have to love your neighbor as yourself. But James doesn't repeat that. James stops at that very first part. So he just mentions, he says, this is the important thing. God is one. Knowing that they would understand, they would be able to, because Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 is where this comes from. Where he, the commandment is you have to love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbors as yourself. He is basically just saying here, remember that. That is the important one. The demons know that. And they get goosebumps thinking about this, that God is a God of unity. This is what James is saying there. So why is it so important to love our neighbor? Because we should not forget where we were. We should look in the Word and we see this is what we have. This is where we came. This is where we are right now. But where do we come from? Because if we forget where we came from, how will we love our neighbor thoroughly? How would we have compassion for them? How would we want to share the gospel for them if we forget where we came from? And that's why it's so important that we have to have, be a God of unity. Now, this is a, a, a commandment from God that we should go and spread the gospel. Now, you may say, I'm too busy. 
I, I really don't have the time, or I don't have the word knowledge. I cannot do it for myself. And that's just deceitful, but I'm not going to blame anybody for saying that because I went through that myself. What I want to say is, even for you who want to say that I have an excuse, I cannot do it, God made a way. God made it possible for you to even share in what somebody else is doing. When we look at Romans 16 verse 23, Paul writes about a man with the name Gaius. And he actually says that this Gaius was the supporter or he was the, the one who, who hosted Paul himself and the whole church. He says, Gaius, who is the host to me and to the whole church here. What does that mean? Gaius was blessing everyone. Gaius was doing good to everyone. Now, I'm not sure if it's the same Gaius. But the Apostle John writes in 3 John 1, and he writes as the beloved elder. He writes to Gaius. And he commends him. He says, you know, the testimony about you have come to my ears that you are doing good to strangers even, but especially to those who have gone out to minister the word. And then in 1 verse 7 he says, For these traveling missionaries have gone out for the name's sake, for his sake, and are accepting nothing from the Gentiles, the heathen, the non-Israelites. So we ourselves, as the believers, ought to support such person, people, to welcome and provide for them in order that we may be fellow worshippers in the truth, the whole gospel, and cooperate with its teachers. So here we see God made a plan that even if you find yourself being too busy, you do not get to, to minister. You have, you have compassion. You remember what it was like when you were lost. You remember how, how lost you felt, and you want others to be saved but you cannot find the opportunity to share the gospel to others. God has, has made a way for you. He says, look, if you at least support those who are doing it, then you're a fellow worker with them. And this is where you are. So I'm not asking you to give money to this ministry. I'm giving you the opportunity to become a fellow worker with this ministry. If you believe that this ministry has integrity, that this ministry is doing the right thing, that this ministry is bringing the gospel, the truth to the people, you have the opportunity this morning to be a partaker with this ministry because you have not forgotten who you were. You have looked in the mirror and you remember, this is where I was. I was lost. We sang so many songs this morning. So I don't need to coerce you in saying, Sow a seed and you get it 60-fold, 100-fold. Because in my opinion, that's out of context. But I am saying to you, you can be a fellow worker. You have the opportunity. There's one box at the back. There's two boxes here in front. There is a box for the priestly offering. And back in the, in the um, kitchen area, there is electronic media. There is uh, all various electronic ways to, to pay. There's PayPal, Zapper, PayPal, any way that you, that you find the opportunity. But listen to what, what James had said. He said, don't just be a hearer, be a doer. Because, and he ends off, um, I can't remember now exactly the, word, the verse. He says in verse 22, verse 26, he says, For the, um, as the human body without its spirit is dead, exactly the same way, your faith without works is also dead. So if you do not do anything, if you're not obedient then your faith means nothing. It's a young man. He's not putting seed. And he says, but I'm a New Testament believer. I have faith that I'll get a harvest. I don't need to do something. You're wrong. You're deceiving yourself. So here's your opportunity. With obedience to what God has called for you, heart to do, here's your opportunity. Thank you.
close on dark nights You calm me down when nothing good For every time I felt alone You called me in and called me God who gives such perfect peace So all my fear and anxiety About to my God, the King of Kings My Prince of Peace inside your perfect light and cried until the healing came I've run away and back to you Morning, everyone. So, how are you this morning? Okay, so I don't have a lot of time, but just bear with me. 
I have a lot of information <laughs> that I want to share. So I'm going to re-preach the message that I did during the lockdown. Um, not many of you were here that morning. It was the first session. It wasn't live as well. Um, and it fits in perfectly with Pastor John's series at the moment. So both, for those that were here that morning, don't worry. I'm going to add a lot, lot more detail. So you can take out your notebooks along. All right. Um, so before I start, I just want to say this, that Okay, so we know in the Bible there's symbolism, we know there are parables, we know there, there are analogies, we know there's some stuff that we need to le- read literal as well, but there's a certain tone of language throughout the Bible, a certain terminology used in the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. Now that terminology, that tone of language is based on the historical context of the Bible. It's not based on our context. So for us to correctly interpret the Bible, apply it to our lives, we need to understand it first in the historical context that it was written in. If we see the truth that was revealed there, we can take that truth and apply it to our lives. But if you want to interpret the Bible into our context directly, that's why we have like 30,000 plus denominations today. All right. So we need to understand the historical context. We need to understand the tone of language used in the Bible. Now, one example... Um, me and JD are currently studying the book of, or the first book of 1 Corinthians um, in our studies. So, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, which speaks about the head covering of the women and should they speak, should they not speak in the church, they presented six different views for us. Now, the one view is actually based on the historical context of the Bible. Now, it says in those times... The women veiled themselves, they covered themselves to protect their dignity. All right? Even the, the Emperor Augustus, he forbid women, the prostitutes and the slave women to cover themselves because according to him, they were not dignified enough. And for the prostitutes, it was also a way of saying, I'm sexually available, by not covering themselves. So when a woman got engaged to a man, she was to veil herself, to cover herself, to... Basically, basically to say, I'm not available anymore. I'm taken. All right. So just something, it's just very important to understand the historical context. Um, we've, we have the same practice today in India and Iran. The Christian women, they still cover themselves. Because if they don't do that, they are seen as immoral. But it's not a custom in our, in our society today, where we live. All right. So women wear what they want these days. Okay. So, just, so it's very important to understand the historical context. Now, okay, so let's jump into it. Let's go to John 14, verse 2 to 3. My topic today is the Father's house. So, yeah, let's get... All right, so let's read from verse 2. So it says, my Father's house has many rooms. This is the NIV version. I think the King James version says um, mansions. So it says, my father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also be where I am, maybe where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. All right. So the father's house. I'm just going to write here quickly. When Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, he was actually referring to an ancient Jewish wedding. So what happened, the wedding took part in about three stages. I'm not going to go into great detail about that because I want to focus on the father's house. But what happens first is the father and the son, some say the son will go alone, some say the father and the son, but they will go to the bride's, and, and the, to the bride's house and the, and the father's house. Then they will go there and they will, actually they will, they will, they will set up a covenant. They will actually, the father, the son actually will pay the bride's father a price for the bride. All right. It was also called the, the Hebrew term there. Um, you can just write here. Price paid. It was called the Moar in, in Hebrew. 
And then um, it was also known as the betrothal. All right. The Hebrew term there is, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, but Udasin or something like that. But that was a Hebrew term used for that. So the father and the son would go there. The son would pay a price to the, to the bride's father. And they were, they were like engaged, but it's not like we understand it today. How they understood it that time is they were like legally married there already. All right. What happened there also, somewhere there, both the, the, the bridegroom and the bride got baptized. Now, the baptism was called the, the mikvah or the mikveh in Hebrew. Now, the mikvah was used for different purification purposes in those days. One of the purposes was when a Gentile converted to Judaism, he went through a, a series of uh, purification processes, and then one of them was the mikvah. He need to, need to got baptized, and then that signified his adoption into Israel, his adoption into new citizenship, to be partaker of the blessings of Israel. All right, so both the bride and the bridegroom were baptized as well. Okay, then after they paid the price, and like I said, legally they were married at that stage already, then the father and his son will go back to the father's house, and they will go and prepare a place for their bride. So the bride will stay with her father at that time. It happens most many times, it will like be a year or two years, that the bride will stay, still stay with her, with her father, but she wasn't available to anybody else anymore. All right, she was legally married. So then they will go back and prepare a place at the father's house, usually. Prepare a place. So usually they will go to the father's house and they will just build an extension to the father's house to prepare a place for the bride. Now when the place was done, when the extension was done, the father will decide and say, okay, it's done now, and he will send the son, okay, go back, go fetch your wife, your, your, your bride. So the father will decide that, and then he sent the son back. Now when the father told, told the son, okay, go fetch your bride, they will sound the trump. Now in the meantime, the, the bride will stay ready. She will stay ready, and when she hears the trump, quickly put on her uh, wedding garments, and she will meet, go out and meet her husband or the bridegroom. All right. And then the marriage ceremony will take place, the marriage supper will take place, and all of that. So that was, let me just write it here. So the marriage supper took place here. There's a lot more detail, but... I'm not going to go into all of that now. Um, so it will take place here, and then they will live their lives together from there. Now, let's look at what Jesus did. First, he came, he came down in John 1. He came to his own. They didn't receive him. But then he paid the price on the cross. We all know that. All right. Well, just another thing. This was also known as the, in the Hebrew, it was known as the, um, not sure how to pronounce this, but nusim. All right, it comes from the word naso. It means to lift up. All right, it means to lift up. So Jesus came. He paid the price on the cross. I'm just going to write it here. That was about plus minus thirty A.D. All right. Just to throw some nuggets there. When Jesus paid the price, he didn't pay the price to God or to the Father. All right? God is love. Love doesn't need a sacrifice from you to forgive you. All right? And 1 Corinthians says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. He was, in the, he was in Jesus on the cross. All right? Secondly, he also didn't pay the price to the devil. All right? We never belonged to the devil. The thief steals something, that item doesn't belong to him. All right? The, the sacrifice was for man. Man's fallen mindset needed the sacrifice to satisfy his guilt. That's what the sacrifice was for. All right. Secondly, at the resurrection, you can go read in, it's in John 20 verse 17, Luke 24 verse 39, Ephesians 1 from verse 17, but when Jesus was res resurrected, Mary met him outside of the tomb. Then he told Mary, don't touch me, because I haven't ascended to my father yet. 
But then he told Mary, go tell the disciples, go tell my brothers, I'm ascending to the Father. All right? After a while, when he appeared to the disciples, he told them, he told Thomas, okay, touch me now. All right? So he went to prepare a place at the resurrection when he ascended to the Father. So this, was, this happened at the resurrection. All right. Then the marriage supper. I will come back to this. All right. But we can read about this in Revelation 19, verse 7 to 9. But I will come back to this. Now, when Jesus said, going back to John 14, verse 2 to 3, he says, In my Father's house there are many rooms. The Greek word there only appears twice in the New Testament. It appears in that verse and also in John 14, verse 23. It means it, when Jesus said, he and, the, he and the Father will come and make their abode with you. All right? So it actually it means to abide. It's an abiding place. All right? So in the Father's house, there's many room to abide. All right? Now, the Jews. Just going to stick with my notes. All right? When, when Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you in my Father's house, they didn't think of heaven somewhere or somewhere out in the sky, flying away. They thought of the temple in Jerusalem. All right? To them, that was the Father's house. Before, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, and he chased out all the guys that did business in the temple, he said, my house is a house of prayer. All right? So the Jews, to them, the temple in Jerusalem was the Father's house. Now, it's very important for us to know, their whole lives, their whole religion was built on the, on the temple of Jerusalem. All right? Because, according to them, that's the way they thought. They could only get healing at the temple. They could only get forgiveness at the temple. They could only get close to God when they go to the temple. Because according to them, God lived in that temple. That was the, that was the only place where God lived. All right. So we, we have to keep that in mind. Now, I'm just going to draw the tabernacle here that Moses built. So Jesus, God gave Moses an instruction to build a tabernacle. Now, the temple in Jerusalem was also based on this. There were a few modifications later on, but it was based on this. All right. So first we had the Holy of Holies. All right. That was the Holy of Holies. I'm just going to do this. And very important to know, the high priest could enter here only once a year. Once a year. The Ark, the Ark of the Covenant was also be in here, and they thought God lived here. According to them, God lived here, and they saw this as heaven. I will explain more about this. But they saw that as heaven. The second compartment was the holy place. Very important, only the priests could enter there. And they performed their daily duties here. They saw this as earth. Then the third compartment was the outer court. All right, There was a, a brazen laver here. With water in, the, uh, the brazen altar was there where they did the sacrifices. The priest washed themselves before they entered the holy place. All right, this was also called the molten sea. In one king seven was twenty three to twenty six, in Solomon's temple. You can go read about it. All right. So this was called the sea. Now, Josephus, Josephus was a famous Jewish historian. All right. Just a bit of background on him. He was born in about 37 AD. That was just a few years after the resurrection. And he came from a priestly background. All right. And he was also a military leader um, of the Jews in Galilee. He fought in the first Roman Jewish war. And then later on, I think it was about 67 AD, he surrendered to Rome. So he was taken hostage. Now, in that time, it's very important to know, Nero was the emperor of Rome. He started a, a brutal persecution on the Christians in 64 AD. Very brutal. He, he was, yeah, he was, he was very evil. He actually, he took Christians, fastened them on poles at night, and then set them on fire to light the city. That's how brutal he was. Now, he died in 68 AD, Nero. So what happens, 
and many saw that as the fall of Rome, or it was actually a bit of chaos in Rome at that time, because it was known as the year of the four emperors. Because then another emperor came, another one, another one, and at the end, Vespasian was called to be emperor of Rome. Now at that time, he was the military leader of the Roman army. They were on their way to Jerusalem to go destroy it, to attack it. But then he was called up to be emperor. So his son Titus took over to be military leader, and then they went from there. Now, interesting that um, Josephus, he had a prophecy. He prophesied to Vespasian that he will become emperor. And after he became emperor, it was about 69 AD, he released Josephus. And Josephus became like an interpreter for Titus, his son. So he, he was an interpreter to the Jews to plead with the Jews to surrender to the, to the Romans. But the Jews didn't do that. They, just, they saw me as a traitor and everything like that. But important to remember, um, or to, to, to take notice of, Josephus was an eyewitness to the destruction of Jerusalem. He wrote about it. He, wrote the, he has a book, The Jewish War. Very notable work of him. All right. So he was an eyewitness to everything that happened before, during, and after. Later he became a Roman citizen as well. Now he says, the tabernacle was built according to creation. So three parts. You got heaven, earth, and sea. He said to the Jews, for them to enter the Holy of Holies, for the high priest to enter here, it was to enter heaven itself. That's how they saw it. The veil here that separated the Holy of Holies and the holy place separated heaven from earth, according to them. All right? Now, to take this to the Bible, and uh, Tanya Annalise, uh, she, touched, she touched on it a few years back, I remember. In Isaiah 66, verse 1, it says, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. All right? So heaven speaks about, it says, there's my throne. It speaks about authority. It speaks about rulership. Then he says, the earth is my footstool. That means that's where the authority is acted out. All right? So the thing that ruled the Jews, their throne, the throne that ruled them was kept here in the Ark of the Covenant. The Ten Commandments was, uh, was kept there. The, the Book of the Law was kept there. That is what ruled them. So this was the throne. This was their throne. And the priest, before they performed the duties of the law in the second compartment. You can read that, uh, about that in Hebrews 9 verse 6. All right? So that authority was acted out here. All right. Okay. But let me show you quickly. Let's go to Deuter uh, Deuteronomy. Um, let's get it quickly. 4 verse 26. I'm going to show you here. I'm just going to use the NIV version today. So listen to what Moses says here. He says, I call the heavens and the earth. Now, heavens, in some translations say heaven, singular. So he says, I call the heaven and earth as witnesses against you this day, that you will quickly perish from the land that you are crossing the, the Jordan to possess. All right. Then he says in Deuteronomy 31, verse 26. I just want to quickly show you what. 31, verse 26. So you guys remember the song of Moses and everything. Moses read the law to them, the song of Moses before he died and before they entered the promised land. Then he says that this, basically after he read the law to them, he says, now take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. There it will remain as a witness against you. So what did we read in Deuteronomy 4? He says, I call the heavens or the heaven and earth as a witness against you. That heaven and earth is not the heaven and earth as we understand it. It is the heaven and the earth as a witness against them. The law. The book of the law. All right? Okay. Let's go. Okay. Now, when Jesus came on the scene, he started healing people left and right. He started forgiving people left and right. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. 
You can only come through me to the Father. He, he said things like, I and the Father are one. Yeah. Now, basically what he was saying, I'm the temple. There's a new way now. Yeah. The way you can, you, the way is not there at the temple there in Jerusalem. I'm the way. I'm the temple. That's why the Jews got so mad. Because he's making himself the temple. He's making himself the, the temple of God. And according to them, God only stayed in Jerusalem, in the temple. All right. So that's why they got so mad. Now, Jesus said in John 17, when he, when he said prepare a place, he was actually saying to prepare a place within him, a fellowship, a place of fellowship within him. He prayed to the Father in John 17. You can go read from verse 22 and onwards. He said, I pray to the Father that they be one in us as we are one. All right. So it was, he, was, he was actually speaking about a place of fellowship within him, an ab abiding place within him. He wasn't speaking about the temple in Jerusalem. The Jews thought he was speaking about the, the temple in Jerusalem. All right. Now let's go to Hebrews 9 from verse 1. Hebrews 9 from verse 1. So it says, Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. The tabernacle was set up in its first room with the lampstand and the table with its consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. The second compartment there. Behind the second curtain, that was the veil, was a room called the most holy place. The holy of holies which had the golden altar of, the, of incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant. This ark contained the gold jar of ma manna, and Aaron's staff that had budded, and the stone ta tablets of the covenant. Above the ark were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. But we cannot discuss these things in detail now. When everything had been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. So they performed the duties in the holy place. But only the high priest entered the inner room, the Holy of Holies, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed. Some translations say manifested. As long as the first tabernacle was still functioning, so meaning the temple in Jerusalem, this is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They, only, they are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already there, or here, he went through that greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made of human hands. That is to say, is not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, thus obtaining internal redemption. Then I just want to read verse 14. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the internal spirit, offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. And then verse 24. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands. That was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Okay, so some verses that I want to point out here. So at first it says, um, I'm going to quickly see. Uh, verse 9. It says that this tabernacle, this temple was uh, an illustration. The word there in Greek is the word... The same word that was used when Jesus spoke in parables. It's a word for parable. All right? So it says this was a parable of the present time. That time back then. So it was a parable. Then it also says that this was a copy or a figure of the true tabernacle. Read that in verse, um, I think it was verse, let me see, uh, 11 and 24. It's a copy of the true tabernacle. Jesus came by the means of the true tabernacle. So I'm just going to write it here. It's a figure of the 
true tabernacle. Parable of the present time. All right. Now, a parable is a comparison that reveals a certain truth. It's not the truth itself, but it reveals something. So that means that that tabernacle, the temple at that time, revealed something. All right? Now, it also says it's a figure of the true tabernacle. Now, what was the true tabernacle? How did Jesus come here? He came in a body. That was a true tabernacle. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's something not made of human hands. Something made by God. All right? If you read Hebrews 2, uh, 8 verse 2, sorry. Let me just go there quickly. I'm going to read from verse 1. It says, now the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by, lo- by the Lord, not by mere human, by u- human being. Then he says, um, if you go read in verse 5, he says, they serve, speaking about the priest on the earth back then, the, the Pharisees and the priests, they serve at the sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. A copy and a shadow. All right? It was a copy. That was a copy and a shadow of the true tabernacle. Then he says, This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Then if you go to verse 8, um, then Jesus says, or God says, But God found fault with the people and said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds, write them on their hearts. So Jesus, he came by the true tabernacle, which is a man's body, and he's the high priest over the true tabernacle, which is man, serving in their hearts, ministering in their hearts, writing the new laws in their hearts. All right? Okay, so that's a true tabernacle. So this was a copy of the true tabernacle, which is man. Just going to do that. All right. But it says, this was also a parable of the present time. Now, we have to remember there was a veil there. A veil speaks of separation. A veil speaks also of alienation from God, separated from God. Now we're reading uh, 2 Corinthians 3 from verse 14 to 15. It says that as long as the old covenant is read, as long as Moses read, there is still a veil remaining on their hearts. He was speaking about, Paul was speaking about the unbelieving Jews. All right? As long as they, st- they stuck to the old covenant, they were, there was a veil on their hearts. They couldn't see. All right, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, going on from that chapter, says, The God of that world blinded their hearts. That God was, wasn't some devil out there. It was the law. It was that temple that blinded their hearts to see who the true tabernacle is. Because they thought the temple in Jerusalem. That's the temple. That's where God lives. And Jesus came to show a new way. That man is the tabernacle. The body is the true tabernacle of God. All right. Okay, so this was a parable of the present time unbelieving Jews. All right, now let me see where I am. Okay, in Acts 7, verse 48, I think it was Stephen speaking there. He says, God doesn't stay in a temple made with hands. We read, we read that in Hebrews as well, right? He doesn't stay in a temple made with hands. Now, that's not something that just became true at that time, it was always true. It was just veiled from them. It was a mystery. That's why Paul speaks in Colossians 1 verse 26 to 27. He says, this mystery was hid from ages and ages, from generation to generation, but it's now revealed to the saints. What is the mystery? Christ in you. That means the hope of glory, yes. But it's Christ in you, meaning man is a true temple. Man is a true tabernacle of God. All right? But as long as this was standing and functioning, it was veiled from them. Because they still went there to worship God. They still went there to pray to God. They still went there to get forgiveness. They still went there to get healing. 
Now that's why Hebrews 9 verse 8 says, it says the Holy Spirit signifying as long as this is still functioning, the new way is not manifested. What is the new way? Jesus says in Hebrews 10 from verse 19 to 22, he says, he has consecrated a new way for us through the veil that is his flesh. So what is the new way? Through the body. Through the body to Christ in you. True fellowship. All right. But as long as that was standing, it was veiled from them. Um, even, even, Jesus even told the disciples in Luke 17 verse 21. That was even before the cross. He says, don't look for the kingdom out there. It's within you. The kingdom of God is within you. It's not out there somewhere. All right. Um, okay, so after the cross, is, we know that Jesus came. He came to fulfill the law. All right. Then he also in Hebrews, it speaks that he, he actually he made the law of none effect. All right? the, the law that was fulfilled, is, it's ready to vanish away. All right? It was fulfilled, so it's ready to vanish away. Now, what happened after the cross, the Jews still went on sacrificing at the temple. They still went on worshiping there, praying there. They, so this was still functioning. So the Holy Spirit says, as long as this is functioning, their hearts are veiled. So now in 70 AD, what happened is the Romans came to destroy the whole Jerusalem with the temple and everything. So the, the Jews, their lives, as they knew it, were totally destroyed. Totally. I mean, I mean they, they kept the genealogies of the different tribes also in the temple. Because according, only the Lev, Levites could minister in the temple. All right? Now, if they don't have the genealogies, they couldn't see who is supposed to be, become priest and who could minister in the temple. So that, all that was destroyed during that time, in 70 AD. Now, you can go this, <laughs> you can read about that. I'm just going to, just to name a few of, uh, scriptures that you can go read about that. And it's, uh, there's, there's actually a bunch of scriptures about the, the destruction of Jerusalem. But in 1 Thessalonians 5, you can read about it. Uh, 2 Peter 3, you can read about it. Um, Jesus prophesied about it in Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13. Now, I will go to some of them now. And also in Revelation 18 and 17, it speaks about that, the, the destruction of that. In Revela Re Revelation 18 and 17, it speaks about the mystery Babylon. It speaks about the, the whore that was riding the beast. The whore refers to, referred to Israel because... Many times in the Old Testament, we can see that they became the harlot because they committed adultery with, with, with Rome and other nations at that time. But in that time, it was Rome. When, just before Jesus was crucified, Pilate was standing there with Jesus and Barabbas. He says, who, who do you want? And they called Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. And Pilate asked him, well, what about Jesus, your king? He says, he's not. And then they, they shouted, and you can read in, in John, he said, we have no king but Caesar. They said they have no king but Caesar. There they committed adultery again with Rome. They, actually, they, well, they were actually divorcing God at that stage. All right. So they were the, the whore that was riding the beast. the beast. The beast was Rome. Then mystery Babylon was speaking about Jerusalem. All right. Jerusalem became like Babylon. All right. Now, then after that we see the the marriage supper of the Lamb, but I will come to that. Let's go to Luke 21, verse uh, 20 quickly. I just want to show you guys something. Here. Now, this is Jesus prophesying about the destruction of Jerusalem. All right? You can even, you can go read in Matthew 24. I think it's from verse, I think, 34. He says, all these things will take place in your generation. Not our generation, that generation. All right. Now, listen to what he says to them in Luke 21, verse 20. He says, when you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, you will know that its desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those in the city get out, and let those in the country not enter the city. So he's speaking about the people living in Judea. He's not speaking about us living here. All right. So he says, when they, when they see the armies surrounding Jerusalem, they have to flee. Don't even go back to get your clothes or anything. Flee immediately. Now let's go to Matthew 24, the mate of this verse. 
from verse 14. Now, let me read from verse 15. He says, okay, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. So the abomination there that makes the abomination of desolation was the Roman armies. All right? The holy place there, the whole Jerusalem and the land of Jerusalem was seen as the holy place, the holy land. All right? And Luke 21 just clarifies to us, it was the Roman armies. Because they were the ab abomination that came to make Jerusalem desolate, destroy it. All right? And it happened in 70 AD. Now, Interesting, I just want to read on uh, in Luke 21. I just want to show you something there quickly. Um, twenty-two, Luke 21, verse 22. Then he says, For this is the time of punishment in fulfillment of all that has been written. Some translations say the time of vengeance or the days of vengeance. That... All that has been written will be fulfilled. When Jesus, um, before they entered Jerusalem, he told his disciples in Luke 18, verse 31 to 33, he says, all things written about me through the prophets will be fulfilled in Jerusalem on, the, on, on his way. Then in Luke 24, verse 44, he says, it is necessary that all things written about him, about Jesus now, that was written in the law, in the prophets, in the Psalms, should be fulfilled. Okay, But now in Luke 21, he says, all things that are written. And when he says that, it's not the whole Bible as we know it. It's the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, the Psalms. He says, these are the days that all things that are written be fulfilled. Because the law spoke about or prophesied about the destruction of Jerusalem. You can read that in Deuter uh, Deuteronomy 32, where the law, also in the law it says, when you do this and this, this will happen, your land will be desolate and everything that's why it was a witness against them, all right? Because it spoke about the destruction of, of the Jews and as the nation and the temple and everything else. Also in the prophets, they prophesied about this. Isaiah, many of the prophets. All right, so he says then, those are the days that all of those things will be fulfilled. Everything that is written, all the prophecies will be fulfilled in those days. All right, so we're not waiting for a future destruction or anything. It happened there. Okay. Now... Matthew 5, verse 18. Jesus says, Not one letter of the law will disappear unless, until heaven and earth pass away. Not one letter of the, earth, of the law will pass away until heaven and earth pass away. When was the law destroyed? When was this, the functioning, the sacrifice and everything, when did it come to an end? But it was destroyed 70 AD. Because then, after that, they didn't sacrifice anymore. After the cross, it was fulfilled at the cross. It was fulfilled there. But the Jews kept on going on with the, with the sacrifices. Yeah, it was totally destroyed. Okay? So until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter of the law will pass away. So it was this heaven and this earth that passed away. Not our heaven and earth as we understand it. Okay? All right. Let's go to... Um, Let's go to Revelation 19 quickly, from 7 to 9. Does it make sense? All right. Okay, I'm going to read from verse 7. Let me read from the New King James Version. Oh, this will not work. I'll use the NIV. Okay. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Now remember I told you guys, Revelation 17 and 18 spoke about the destruction of the temple. All right? Then after that, John's 
John says this, he sees this, he says, let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. All right, so the marriage supper took place there. I just want to, let's go to Revelation 21 from verse 1. So John says there, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So this passed away. Then he says, and there was no more sea. No more sea. No more outer court. One commentator said that there's no more outer court for the common people to come and get close to God or to worship God. Because the rest of Israel could enter here, but only here. All right? He says, no more outer court. He says, we are the new heaven and earth. We are the new temple, the royal priest. Um, so he says, for the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. So that new city, the new Jerusalem, is the bride prepared for a husband, which is Christ, okay? Now, let's see quickly. Go to verse 14, Revelation 21, verse 14. I'm almost done, so, uh, almost. The wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb, the 12 disciples, okay? Those were the foundations of the city. Let's go to Ephesians 2. From verse 19. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you two, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So there it is. The city is us. Built on the foundation of the apostles. The chief cornerstone being Jesus Christ. Right? And we are built into a building and habit, habited, or through a habitation by the spirit of God. All right? So we, the temple, the new city, the new Jerusalem, the temple of the, of the Holy Spirit. Which is God, all right. Um, 1 Peter 2. From verse uh, 4. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, not chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God, through Jesus Christ. So again, it says, we are living stones built up into a spiritual house where God lives. So how did Jesus prepare a place? From here to there, this happened. So the marriage supper happened after the veil. The thing that veiled them to have fellowship with God was taken out. The marriage supper took place. Because supper in those days was, was also seen as fellowship. Okay? To have fellowship. Fellowship of Christ. Free access to God. So this happened. So in this time, from the resurrection to 70 AD, it was about 40 years. Jesus was preparing a place. He was preparing a place. How did he prepare a place? He prepared the, their minds that they are the city. The city is not out there. The temple is not out there. You're the temple. Busy preparing the minds. And then the last veil was taken out. So they, can, could see, they could see and they can have fellowship with Christ within them. All right. True fellowship. Let me see where I am. Now, God's plan from the beginning was for all of Israel. When he chose Israel to be priests. 
Now, when Jesus told the disciples, I'm going to prepare a place for you in my father's house, he was also telling them, I'm going to make you priests. Because only the priest could minister in the house of God. All right? So he was telling them, I'm going to make you a holy priesthood. If you read in Exodus 19, verse 6, before the law was given, God told uh, Moses, he said, you, you guys will be, or Israel will be to me a holy nation, a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood, actually. All right? A royal priesthood. But then on Mount Sinai, the Israelites told Moses, no, no, we don't want to speak to God. You go speak to God. So they had free access, and they said, no, we don't want free access. We don't want fellowship. You go speak to God for us. There they stopped it. There the veil happened, all right? So that veil had to be taken out for free fellowship again. All right. So it happened there after 70 AD. And it, in a way, it's still happening because we have free fellowship with Christ. We are free to eat from the tree of life within us. The new way is manifested. It's not somewhere at a building somewhere. It's within us. Christ within us. All right. We have free access. Now, to, to close off, why did God use the concept of a tabernacle? If man was also always the true tabernacle of God, the true temple of God, why did God use this, this con the concept of this? Now, again, we have to understand the historical context of what happened back then. First, God, he chose Abraham. He called him out of the Gentile nation. Then later on, when Abraham, he got a son, Isaac, God commanded him and said, okay, go sacrifice Isaac at this place, this mountain. Now, interestingly, I, got, I, I heard a, God, a guy, not God, I heard a guy preach on this. And he's, he said, ever wondered why Abraham didn't even complain? Yeah, God asked him, okay, Go sacrifice your son, your only son. Go kill him. He didn't even complain. He just went. Now, I know we read in Hebrews that he believed that God will raise him from the dead. Okay, but still, the act of killing your only child, even if God raised him afterwards, yeah, that act is enough to put guilt on you forever. All right? But Abraham didn't complain. He just went with it. The, the culture Abraham grew up in, sacrificed their children to false gods. It was a normal thing for them back then. They th sacrificed their children to, to false gods. And the, the, the more valuable the sacrifice was, it showed the, their commitment. The more it showed their commitment towards, towards their, their false gods. Right. So it was some, something common in, that, in those days. All right. So that's why Abraham, okay, here God asked me, here God asked me to go sacrifice. It wasn't something new to him. All right. Okay. If God asks you to sacrifice your child, yeah, you will not be able to do that. And in the first place, you will know it's not God speaking to you. That's not God. All right. Okay. So Abraham went. He went to a mountain that God showed him. We also know that they say it was the same mountain that, was Jesus, that Jesus was crucified on. But So he's on the mountain. He's ready to kill Isaac. Then God stopped him. And he provided the, the it was a ram in the, in the bush. Yes. But what was God saying to Abraham? He was telling him, I'm not like your false gods. I don't need the sacrifice of your, of your son. All right. So God stripped that away. That lie is stripped away. Then Israel was for about plus minus 400 years in Egypt. All right. They served there. Now the Egyptians believed their God lived in temples. So they had temples. And in their temples, there was also a holy place where they kept the idol of, that rep represented their God. And also they had priests uh, ministering in those temples. So that concept crept into the minds of the Israelites. So when Jesus, when God instructed Moses to build a tabernacle for him, it wasn't something new to them. It was, they, or they, were, they were familiar with the concept, all right, that God, lived, that God lived, lives in a temple. Now we also, sometimes we forget, but Moses was, he was taught in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. It says it there in the Bible. So, but the only difference is when God instructed Moses to build the tabernacle, it was built according to the true tabernacle. That was the only difference. All right? And all the ministry that took place in that tabernacle was a, was a shadow of the, true tab, of the true ministry that Jesus came to do in your hearts. All right? Okay. It was a shadow of the, of the true 
things. Oh, and Jesus was a substance of what that st- uh, stood for. All right. Now, so somewhere in the bio, somewhere in the Old Testament, the ark that was kept here, that represented God, was stolen. It was stolen. It wasn't there anymore. So when Jesus died on the cross, and Pastor John mentioned it last time, the veil was torn. There was no ark of the covenant. Right? So God already showing them, I'm not here. I'm not in your temple. I'm not living there. Then at 70 AD, he stripped away the last lie, the temple. So what was God doing? He came down to the level of man to strip away all the lies. First, he stripped away the high places. The high places, we see that also in the Old Testament. The Israelites, when they turned away from God, they went and sacrificed at the high places to Baal. Because they believed the higher the place, the closer they are to God. That's also a lie they believed. Then he stripped away the ark. Then he stripped away the temple. To manifest the new way, which is man. That's why Paul said in Acts 17 to unbelievers, he says, we all are God's offspring. And in him we live and move and have our being. All right. So how do this apply to our lives today? I'm finishing now. Most of us know that God lives in us. We, we, we know that. But do we act like that? Do we act like that always? Sometimes we still find ourselves begging to God. Begging for God to come through. He's here. He's here. That's also not understanding and knowing that God's inside of you. That's the number one problem of racism in the world. Because when you still see people as black, white, brown, evil, bad, good, bad, you're not seeing the temple of God. You're not seeing Christ in them. You're still still seeing them as bad according to their actions, according to their skin color. Not seeing them as a true tabernacle of God. So it's our, it's our responsibility first to act, to start acting like we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that God is in us, and reveal that to people around us, to see them, to treat them like that. All right. So let's stand. I think, uh, uh, so I'm just going to pray for you guys. It's over time already. Um, and then if you have one prayer, you can come to us afterwards, after prayer. But yeah, and just quickly pray for you guys. So Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word. And I thank you for your truth that is revealed. And I thank you that it will enlighten people's hearts, Father. That you are not far from them. That you're not somewhere they need to go to. But they are, you are inside of them. And they have free access to you. They, can, they have free fellowship with you, Father. So I want, you, God, I want you, Father, just to reassure people, Father, that you are there. You are faithful and that you are one with us. Now, thank you, Father, that we can live with that in mind and help us to, to manifest Christ everywhere we go, Father. Now, thank you for your goodness. Now, thank you for your people. And I just speak that you will bless them, Father, that your blessings will manifest in their lives, Father. That everything that they, that they are in you will manifest in their lives, Father. Everything that they are partakers of Christ will manifest in you, Father, and in them, in their lives, Father. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can go home. You guys can go home. <laughs> if you want prayer, then you can come to the front. <laughs>